There we go. Got it. Perfect. All right. I will let folks in. <clears throat> well, good afternoon to those who are tuning in. We're going to just give a minute or two for folks to keep keep trickling in. Once I see it, ask them total. Um, start the uh, the session. But if you're here for the Grassland 2.0 Spring Digital Dialogue, you're in the right place. So thanks for joining us. The turnstile is still turning, so we'll just let it keep turning here for a minute. 102 at this point. Fantastic. <laughs> so why don't we get started here? Hi, I'm Randy Jackson. I'm the Director of uh, Grassland 2.0, which is a, a USDA funded five year grant uh, whose goal is to explore uh, how it is we might transform our agricultural landscapes to provide what we want and need out of the landscape, which is to say uh, uh, profitable farming systems, uh, productive farming systems, healthy farming systems, uh, farming systems that help clean water rather than pollute it and uh, farming systems that help stabilize climate rather than uh, destabilize it or change it. Uh, farming systems that help build and support biodiversity rather than um, causing it to plummet, which is what's been happening for uh, many decades now. So uh, the main goal of Grassland 2.0, the main uh, deliverable, if you will, is uh, to develop what we call an agroecological transformation plan which is uh, academic parlance for a blueprint that uh, would sort of lay out what needs to happen in order for those, that sort of transformative change to happen. A big part of our agroecological transformation plan is um, obviously policy and um, how it is we shape policy and what our policies do and say and how they're enforced. And uh, so we've been uh, exploring questions like what are the main levers that we might be able to pull in order to help make transformational change. So we heard from our, our guest uh, last uh, fall in what we call our meta lab meeting, which is sort of our, it's more or less an internal sort of uh, workshop. And uh, this digital dialogue series is meant to be more of a public facing and uh, um, uh, pep rally kind of a workshop. So um, we thought we'd invite uh, our guest back to talk to us more about the levers that we might pull to make change. Without further ado, I'm just going to say that uh, I'm going to put in the chat a link to what we call our land ethics statement, which speaks to our commitment to not only thinking about how to transform agriculture so that it's better for us uh, environmentally, but how to diversify our landscapes, how to return people to our lands uh, in ways that are just, equitable, and, and inclusive. And it's something that we're committed to and continue to pursue and understand that we may never achieve, but we have to keep uh, working in that direction. So I'll put that link in the chat and then just introduce Dr. Sarah Lloyd, who heads up uh, some of our supply chain activities in the Grassland 2.0 project, stalwart graduate of UW-Madison, and uh, 
let me stop yammering and turn it over to Sarah. Sarah, take it away. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here and wonderful to see the robust turnout, which we, of course, would expect when we get to hear from Austin Frerich and get uh, in conversation with him. So I'm just going to take a second to introduce um, Austin. He is the deputy director of the Thurman Arnold Project at Yale. He's a senior fellow at Data for Progress and also a fellow at the Harkin Institute at Drake University. Um, I have had a great opportunity to bump into Austin Frerich uh, here and there along the way of this intersection of looking at the economic structures and systems of agriculture in our food system and the political, so the political and economic structures. Um, uh, he has been writing quite a bit and uh, it's great that his, his careful work looking at concentration, uh, growing concentration in agriculture and the food system is, is widely picked up. Um, he had a very a uh, well-cited article that appeared in the American Conservative uh, looking at uh, concentration. And I was able to uh, participate by listening in on a, a conference that he organized last January called Big Ag and Antitrust Competition Policy for a Sustainable and Humane Food System. And this was uh, with the Yale Law School. So uh, I really encourage folks to check out Austin Frerich's work and his writing, and I'm, I'm very glad to share it, uh, that he's going to share it with us. And another tidbit about um, really participating in uh, being the change that we're all working on. Austin is running for office in Iowa for state Senate right now. So uh, that's also something we can talk to him about perhaps offline, but um, he's certainly knee deep in all the action at the state and national and international level looking at concentration. So I'm going to turn it over to Austin. Um, Wall Street's farm bill, the farm bill uh, conversations are started up in Congress, and this is a good time for us to learn a little bit more. So thanks, Austin. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, first of all, it's good to see so many familiar faces. Um, I want to send everyone this quick link before I forget. Um, speaking of that big egg conference, Next month, I'm hosting another one called Reforming America's Food Retail Markets, or as I call it, the Grocery Store Conference. Um, Wisconsin's own Pete Harding, well, actually, of the Milkweed, will be presenting a paper I'm really, really excited for about how, I can't remember if it's called DFA or Dean Foods anymore, but they basically have an 85% market share in New England and the greater New York City area. So yeah, fantastic conference. We have about 18 papers, everything from dollar stores to Amazon Go stores. And yeah, so let's dig in. So let me explain the title of my presentation. I, I call it the Wall Street Farm Bill because if there's one takeaway from this presentation is our farm bill is built for Wall Street. That's it, that's, that's all it cares about. It's all about how can we Pepsi pay the least amount as possible for chips and pop, Smithfield for the feed, all that kind of stuff. It is not built for farmers, it is not built for workers, and it's part of this bigger deregulation era we're living in right now. And I think hogs best capture that. Um, we basically see workers in slaughterhouses are making less than they used to. We see farmers getting the lowest share of every dollar of dollars we spend in the store ever recorded. Bacon was cheaper under Truman than uh, Obama. So we're not, you know, we're not even saving money when we shortchange farmers and, and uh, workers. And then we see CEO pay where the current CEO of the company that owns Smithfield making got to exit out the chat in front of me, $291 million a year. So what we've seen in the food system, as hogs show us, is powers concentrated into the hands of fewer and fewer people. Um, when we talk about this, I like to think about the American food system as kind of two big frameworks over the last century. I kind of called the first one the New Deal framework, one kind of rooted in balance of how do you produce enough for you know Americans to You're muted. Austin, you muted yourself. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Um, where did where did that cut off, Carl? Oh, just a moment ago. Okay. Yeah, not long. Sorry about that, guys. So yeah, so the New Deal, this kind of balance in the food system is really rooted in Henry Wallace, the Secretary of Agriculture for Roosevelt, and then Louis Brandeis, who was appointed by uh, Teddy Roosevelt to, no, sorry, President Wilson to be a Supreme Court justice. And that was rooted in competition policy or antitrust. Fast forward to the current framework we're all living under in our food system is this neoliberal, but I just call it second gilded age, laissez-faire uh, framework. And to me, that's rooted in Earl Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture under Nixon, and then Robert Bork, uh, Reg, uh, the failed Supreme Court nominee for Reagan, and also Nixon's hatchet man. But I think part of the hope, and or the hope of this conversation to me is what could be next? Because it's clear this second Gilded Age is running itself into the ground. I should also say too, when we talk about the New Deal, let's also keep in mind in agriculture, the darkest sins of America, come out of agriculture from genocide to slavery. So we, we, there's not really a moment in the past we can look to and say, oh, we should go back to that era in agriculture. There are frameworks we can borrow from, but let's keep in mind just how disproportionate they benefit a small group of Americans. Um, just a brief history, just kind of on that New Deal farm bill. I mean, basically what we had was the Great Depression came a decade early to rural America. Farmers were asked to uh, produce a lot for World War I because all the battlefields in Europe were you know, not in production. So they ramp up production. And then all of a sudden when those fields came back online, you have overproduced markets. And then you had a lot of land being pushed too far, you know, creating the Dust Bowl. And so you just have these glutton markets and you know, all these farm protests over the Midwest. Um, comes along Henry Wallace, who actually was writing a lot about this, of just the failure of this laissez-faire framework, where, I mean, think about it. If you're about to lose your farm, you're gonna keep pushing your land, you're gonna keep overproducing, because if you don't, you're gonna lose it. And so there's no incentive for the market to self-correct itself until a bunch of people go through catastrophic bankruptcies and losses. So his whole thing was, and I'm condensing a lot of history here, because these weren't, you know, the farm bill wasn't one bill like it is now. It was actually a series of bills. There was, you know, you had industry actually the Republican Party, former Republican Party chairman sued, overturned it. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, I'm simplifying this story here, but what it really was, was a three-legged stool of conservation, crop insurance, and price income supports, you know, and they were all interconnected where in order to get one, you had to do another, like in order to get your conservation money, you had to do something, but it was all about finding that happy middle of production. I should also say what I didn't know, and I think it's been kind of lost in some agriculture history is how it happened in the South, because of the power of Southern Democrats, the way this money was administered was at the county level. So un, un, not shocking anyone, a lot of the Southern county officials who handed out the money purposely neglected sharecroppers. I mean, white Southern farmers really weren't farmers. It was the black sharecroppers that did most of the work. And so what you saw is, you know, when these markets overproduced, you know, these white landowners in the South were getting money, they would just pocket the change and then kick the black sharecroppers off their farmland. Um, there was a very famous moment in USDA where um, a group of reformers were trying to actually st step in and protect sharecroppers and say, hey, if you're going to pocket this government money, you can't do that. Um, Wallace sided with Farm Bureau and the, sure and the uh, Southern Democrats and overruled it. Um, you know, a lot of this great migration, incredible book on this, Month of Other Sons, talks about this. And so what we see in the South is not only are they kicking off um, African-Americans um, off the land, but they're also then using that capital to industrialize their farmers because there was a lag in tractors. And so you see this massive industrialization in the South. Um, I love this quote by uh, President Harry Truman in Dexter. Dexter, Iowa, it was at the National Plowing Convention. This is kind of in between Des Moines and Omaha. Quote, it is terribly dangerous to let any one group get too much power in the government. We cannot afford to let one group share the nation's policy in its own interest at the expense of the others. That is what happened in the 1920s under the big business rule of the Republicans. Those were the days when big corporations had things their own way. The policies that Wall Street big businesses wanted were the policies that the Republicans adopted. Agriculture, labor, and small businesses played second fiddle while big businesses called the tune. And I can go out to you know, I can, these words ring true today. I mean, this stuff is a tale as old as time. Um, fast forward. So 
I kind of, what I label as the Wall Street Farm Bill is the 1996 Farm Bill. It was kind of, it's informally known as Freedom to Farm. What's ironic about that is that's actually the name of Ezra Taft Benson's uh, book published in the 1960s. And that whole thing was, you're always going to have people that will preach the gospel of big business. You know what I mean? That, that's, you know, you're always just going to have those types. It's the easiest way to have a life. You do what you're told, you get a big paycheck. And you're always going to have that. The, the second you put up, you know, boundaries, protections, regulations, you're going to have people that come along and do the bidding of the rich. And so Ezra Taft Benson was Eisenhower's uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts, who um, I kind of hold up as the big framework here, you know, worked for him. Um, they tried to essentially deregulate the farm bill, but, you know, because of the power, the voting power at the time, they weren't able to do it. But what you see is they slowly over time, they, these protections, the interlockingness go away. And what we see in the 1996 farm bill is President Clinton did what Reagan tried to do and couldn't do. And he's, he fully deregulated the farm bill. So all these, a lot of the caps we see in the program, how much one person can get are removed. The strings attached to the programs are removed. And the whole framework now is about the overproduction of a few key things. More, more, more. And that's kind of how we get to this current system. And what that current system is, is, I mean, take these three uh, beverage items. You know, you have basically unhealthy food has gotten a lot cheaper in America as, as quote, healthy food gets crowded out. I mean, I, I know for the, you know, the academics on this talk, you know, uh, Cranberries are supply managed, but let's be honest, we know cranberry juice cocktail is mostly sugar. So we see the two sugar items here are way cheaper than, you know, carrot juice, because right now the farm bill essentially incentivizes overproduction or heavily subsidizes sugar. And what we also seen, and one of my favorite scholars is Julia Guthman in the UC system, wrote a book called Weighing In, is so much of the national, this um, obesity crisis in America is rooted as a personal fail, you know, personal thing when it's really structural. And we see it in the data on obesity as, as this food system starts getting deregulated, you know, Oreos become, you know, you see people, especially as income stagnate, choose the cheaper calorie options. And then you also see, you know, fruits and vegetables get more expensive as more farmland is put into this production. Um, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. And what we see in just talking about the rise of obesity in America, you know, it's, it's, it's hurting our low income Americans the most, you know, predominantly, you know, black female low income is disproportionately the most, you know, you know, um, you know, has obesity and a lot of that just rooted in, you know, structural inequalities in America and all that kind of stuff. And these trend lines keep increasing, especially with child obesity and COVID. So what this means though for our produce production um, is a lot of this being offshore because with all these free trade agreements, what that really means is it's a race to the bottom in terms of labor environmental standards. Um, there's a great series in the LA Times a few years ago called like Made in Mexico, I believe, where it talks about like when you get a tomato in Wisconsin in January, <laughs> it's coming from Baja, California and it's coming from kids that are paid $5 a day and they're probably 12 years old. And then you have another LA Times story talking about a lot of the gangs in Mexico are getting into the avocado industry. I mean, I would compare it to like sweatshop labor and t-shirts where the more you, you create these supply chains that are offshore, it gets harder and harder to validate them to see what's going on here. And what that means is for like a farmer, if I'm trying to grow tomatoes and I don't think anyone would grow tomatoes in Wisconsin, but if I'm trying to grow produce in Wisconsin, you, you're not competing fairly. You're, not, you're competing against enslaved labor. <laughs> And so that's what we're seeing happen is this movement of offshore, anything that's labor intensive in fruits and vegetables is moving offshore. Um, this is part of that story in the LA Times about kids picking peppers. Um, so now moving to antitrust. Um, Mike, I am part of this Brandeis movement. And what that means is America's antitrust laws from a century ago really come out of this man named Louis Brandeis. Um, before he was a Supreme Court judge, ju uh, judge, um, he was uh, a corporate lawyer. And what he saw, and he, what he saw was most of the time when monopolies or consolidation happens, it's not through organic growth. It's through acquisition after acquisition and cutting corners. And he famously fought a uh, railroad monopoly in New England who promised all you know, these bells and whistles. And it turns out there's tons of accidents and a lot of bribery that went into building that empire. So his whole thing was his philosophy, his framework was how do we deconcentrate power? 
because we know with concentrated economic power comes concentrated political power that corrupts and corrodes the system. Because let's never forget that no business wants to compete. Competition isn't profitable. Profitability comes from monopoly. So there's natural yin and yang between the two of, we need to protect markets, police them, make sure they're competitive, where it's a business will, it's in their economic interest to buy the political system so it becomes more profitable. And so he always, I mean, that's his framework, is how do we create market structures that diffuses power to prevent this concentration? So like taking two different examples, one example is vertical integration. Think like a supply chain, you know, feed goes to a mill, it goes to feeding livestock, to slaughterhouse. And the other one is horizontal integration, which is like, think of all the, you know, grocery store chains. So a Lewis Brandeis framework is how do we put up barriers to stop consolidation? How do we stop someone from owning the feed, the feed mill, the livestock producer, the slaughterhouse, all that kind of stuff. One really good example of that, um, and I, we were talking about this earlier is my, so my father was a beer distributor and my grandfather when I was growing up and beer is a really interesting example of a constructed market, like intentionally designed to diffuse power. There's a really good um, episode on this by Ken Burns and Prohibition on PBS that talks about kind of this history. Basically what we saw is we saw beer companies get fully vertically integrated before, before prohibition. And what they would do is they would essentially get their consumers drunk because you, you even though they would sell essentially at cost because they would make their money once you're drunk, you know, on the other stuff, prostitution, other drugs, that kind of thing. And we saw all these societal ills as a result of that. And so when we then legalized alcohol again, we intentionally um, diffuse this power structure. Hold on, I'm trying to, where we send, if you brew and you distribute and you retail, are th you have to be three different things. You cannot, you cannot be fully vertically integrated. And even on the distribution side, we carved up in America into these little markets. And so going back to this Brandeis framework, so what a Brandeis person would do is say, hey, if you're a slaughterhouse, you cannot own the animal you slaughter. And then like for the horizontal side, you would say, oh, you can, you can no longer buy companies once you hit a certain market share. Um, I wanna bring this up because I think this is a really important historical thing that's been kind of lost or kind of being resurrected now. And that is a lot of times it's these monopolists that tends to the finance fascist. And there's a really good book on this called Hell's Cartel. IG Farben was Hitler's largest political donor. And you know what Hitler would do is he'd walk into the room saying, oh, I don't mean all that crazy rhetoric. I just wanna help you sell more chemicals. They were a chemical company. They did a lot of nitrogen. And so Auschwitz was actually built to be a nitrogen factory. After World War II, America came in, we did a lot of antitrust enforcement um, in these countries. And one was breaking up IG Farben. It was breaking up and broken up into seven different companies. But you know, slowly what we've kind of seen is um, these companies consolidate again. And one of the companies that was broken up into was Bayer, you know, that you know, a few years ago acquired Monsanto. But I think this history of the relationship between fascism and corporate consolidation is a very important one. Um, as we know, every politician loves saying they love small business. It's catnip. These words mean nothing, though. You know, here it's a bunch of presidents going back to Reagan who sit there and say small business. We they love small business, yet they support uh, a new antitrust framework that essentially undermines is undermines small business. And what I mean by that is basically this man, Robert Bork, Nixon's hatchet man, the next the man who's willing to, we found out later, willing to do quasi-illegal things, maybe, and fire Archibald because he was promised a Supreme Court seat. We currently take our antitrust framework from this man. I'm a personal believer in someone's moral character if it's bad undermines their academic scholarship. Um, call me old fashioned. But anyways, Robert Bork came up with this whole, kind of honestly essentially made up theory, or sorry, made up in the legal sense that oh, all we care about in antitrust is two companies can merge so long as they can prove that their merger will lower prices for consumers. Well, guess what? You have a whole batch of um, academic economists who make actually more than what they probably make at their university salary, you know, writing these studies that justify the mergers. Oh, sure, Sprint can buy T-Mobile. We'll go from four cell phone carriers to three. Here's an economic study. Um, too bad these studies never see the light of day and they kind of go against common sense, but it's incredibly lucrative. Add that into the fact that you have this group called the Federalist Society, you know, that spent over a quarter billion dollars in the last few decades, basically pushing judges that accept this kind of uh, libertarian framework. Um, 
there's been a, a study actually by someone who now works for the FTC, Chair Leo Khan, showing that, you know, these consumers don't say money. I mean, Consumer Reports had this great investigation where they did the most Consumer Reports thing where they call around, ask how much do these five drugs cost? Turns out your local pharmacist was way cheaper than Walgreens and CVS. And so I think part of what we're living through right now in this consolidation era is this kind of pro-monopoly framework that was brought in by the Reagan administration and that Democrats really haven't pushed back until very recently. And most of the consolidation isn't coming to organic growth, like I mentioned, but tons of you know acquisitions that should never have been approved. Um, I really recommend Philip Howard's work at Michigan State on this. Um, he actually just came up, came out with a new version of this book, but he has all these great charts just showing you here's all these little buys over time. And a lot of times, you know, when they buy these companies, you know, it's a plant here, a brand there, but they kind of fly underneath the radar, but it's over time where this power accumulates. If you think, here's a Smithfield, for example, you look at number one, look at all these different brands they own, and this is their slaughterhouse and their capacity. And so, you know, what you might know Smithfield, but then I don't think most people realize this illusion of choice with those other brands. And from a worker standpoint, it's really hard to, exert worker power, unionize when you have, you know, productions going on at 15 different plants. So you can just easily shift it between the two. Um, here's another example of Whole Foods, of just how Whole Foods became Whole Foods. I mean, this is not even including the fact that the richest man in the world, or maybe second richest, I don't keep track of it anymore, now owns it, you know, it was acquisition after acquisition. And I think this really goes to show you that whole Michael Pollan framework up, you know, you change a system with your fork, doesn't really do anything, power, you know, you're not, if you don't change structures, you don't change structures. Um, this slide I realize is comically, it's funny, it's from 2002, look, it's Amazon's market value size compared to, you know, a bunch of the other strip malls change you'll see around America. But I mean, think of how much has changed since 2002. I mean, what, Amazon's now worth two or three trillion? I can't even keep track of it. Um, the huge consolidation of power in that space. And then what this means in the grocery store space is, you know, we saw that they bought Whole Foods because they wanted, they're making that play. They're now opening, opening a bunch of these Amazon Fresh stores, which is kind of like a Safeway. So it's more, they realize the Whole Food name is a little too bougie. So they're trying to go down more mass market. So they're in Amazon Fresh. But to me, I think the scariest thing, and we actually have a few papers at the grocery store conference and putting together next month is the Amazon Go stores. Those are the stores you walk in, you scan your, your little Amazon app, and there's cameras all around you. You grab what you want and you leave. Um, that present, I mean, just think of the mass layoffs that are going to come of that result, but then also the consolidation of who owns that software, if, you know, they become that provider and have that monopoly. Um, so what happens with this, when we have the result of this framework of consolid, you know, this deregulation of competition protections and the deregulation of the farm bill, that's kind of what this section's about. First, for every dollar you spend in the store, we've seen that collapse for farmers. I mean, from a record high, basically at the end of you know, Roosevelt's time in office, 1945, essentially half. So every dollar people spent, farmers got half. And as they're basically, we see the deregulation slowly chip away, their bargaining power has just collapsed to the lowest level ever. Um, one data note, the reason why the lines are different colors is there wasn't, there was a methodology change um, in the data. I think what's also really interesting, and I recommend reading if you have time, are these fantastic WA guides from the 1930s. Imagine Wikipedia for your state, but also park road trip. So it's actually really fun to read if you wanna like learn. But what I loved about it was A, I always have much more regional productions of food items that I didn't know about. I mean, you'll see in the summer in Iowa, I have to also apologize, my, my presentation gets very Iowa focused, but to me, I think rooting it in one place and showing very concrete examples is enable, it's enables me to show you the bigger picture through concrete examples. But in Iowa, like, I mean, I you see in the summer, muscatine melons are for sale because that part of Iowa is really sandy soil down by the Mississippi, so they sell melons. But we used to have tons of beet, sugar beet productions in uh, Northern Iowa, peaches in the South, wine on the West part of the state where it gets kind of hilly, onions around Davenport, that's all gone. All that production is gone because of this system that really pushes people to get big or get out and to really focus on doing one or two things. So check out this chart, this one with all the green stuff. If we rewind the clock a century ago, we see that most farms you know, have a lot of different things going on, a lot of different livestock, a lot of different items are growing. And think of it kind of like a retirement account. You want to diversify your portfolio so that way in case one, you know, one market crashes, you still have other things. What we've seen essentially happen, fast forward to now, 
because most farms are only doing two, two, maybe three items. So that makes them incredibly fragile. And as we've seen with COVID, when you, you know, you're not resilient at that point. And so any shock to the system can be incredibly detrimental to a fam family farm or to a farm, I should say. And so, you know, talking about get bigger, go home, we've seen the average size of the family farm, can, you know, grow massively. And then, you know, now we're at the point where Bill Gates is the largest owner of farmland. I mean, the fact that he owns, and no one knew about it until some report, until that one person at the land report discovered it, that he owns as much farmland as 17 Manhattans. And to me, my favorite little factoid is, here's a man spending all this money telling us how to improve sustainability, blah, blah, blah. Yet he doesn't even do it on his own land. It just tells you the hollowness of the billionaire class. Um, what we've also seen is the consolidation in the meat and dairy sector. I mean, here's the successful farming pork rankings to now where the largest one in five hogs or so is, you know, is owned by a foreign company, Smithfield. And you essentially have the 10 largest corporations owning two thirds of all hogs. Um, and as we see in this chart over here, uh, we just essentially seen as over time, the, the collapse of the hog family farm. And we're seeing it now in dairy and we're starting to see it in beef. And the, my big point is people, you know, you'll have these higher gun economists say, oh, it's efficiencies. And I just throw that out the window. I mean, most of this is, it's just people ignoring regulations, buying off the system, whatever have you. I mean, the, the example in hogs is a state senator named Wendell Murphy in North Carolina. He essentially wrote the regulations in North Carolina to essentially allow industrial, those industrial hog operations, CAFOs. And then you sit there and see, and then he, so he wrote the regulations and then he built the empire. Like Smithfield's hog empire is because they bought his empire. And so you sit there and see swine production take off in North Carolina after he deregulated this thing. In my home state of Iowa, you saw this race to the bottom where Iowa's like, oh, we want to stay number one. We can't lose market share in North Carolina. And so we deregulated and, you know, we have CAFOs everywhere. And this is one of those good examples of this could have all been prevented. Imagine if the feds, if USDA stepped in and said, no, 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 we're not going to play this game. I mean, the story of meat and dairy in America is a chickenization where when we had the jungle, we had all these rules come out a century ago against big meat. We didn't write chicken into the regulation because Americans didn't eat chicken. And what happened is basically chicken did, chicken really resembles a modern day sharecropping model. It's incredibly exploitive. It's horrific. 70% of the growers live in poverty. But because they were gaining market share, what you, we saw is in the second Gilded Age, instead of telling chicken, no, you got to behave like the other in industries, we essentially allowed a race to the bottom for the other meats. And so we've seen the chickenization of pork, chickenization of dairy. I mean, here's that example of Iowa. I mean, just look at this map of these little dots. These are where CAFOs are. And you can just show, I mean, Iowa and Illinois especially are just, hey, they're like CAFOs, this is a free for all. Um, and this is at the same time too, I should say, where, you know, I mean, the DNR that oversees these in Iowa has had its budget cut. I mean, you're just seeing an expansion of this as the regulatory system has collapsed. Um, I wrote about this. I wrote this article last year about a hog bear in Iowa, how the one man in Iowa came to own 5 million hogs, 7,000 employees, and then a 21 seat corporate jet with a home, a mansion in the only gated community in Iowa, and then a mansion down in Naples, Florida. So the first year when we were all locked in our homes, he logged over 200 flights on his corporate jet flying back and forth. Do we want this to be a family? Is this what we want? I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves. I mean, look at this photo alone where you drive in rural America and the fact that you, it's normal to see a dumpster full of, you know, the hogs, like, cause it's just, that goes to show you we, we've de de devalued the work. I mean, these are just numbers in Excel sheet. Like, oh, na we're naturally gonna lose 5% of the herd to this model. I mean, if you keep in mind too, that these animals can't even live naturally in these sheds. I mean, if the power goes out and the fans go out, they die. And that's actually what they did during COVID is they shut the fans off and they, they turned the heat up so they would die faster. That's how they cleaned the herd. But also look at that photo of one of their operations. I mean, there's no cover crop on that land. It's just grim. I mean, you just, you look at that and you just realize this is what this model has become. Um, what we've seen in the farming sector is, you know, the average farm household, just, you know, their income is, you know, now is above the U.S. household income. What's misleading about that stat, though, is there's, there's a bifurcation. You know, you have CSA farmers on one end barely getting by, and then you have these mega, the few that survive this model, on the other hand. There is no middle. I mean, it's kind of re mirroring the greater American trend right now of the collapse of the middle class. But um, I know... 
we're talking in Wisconsin. I mean, what's happening to dairy to me is incredible. Um, the fact that, you know, it's, I was still shocked to learn that New Mexico has a massive dairy operation. And that's something I've been doing a lot of research lately on is I, I'm writing about a dairy baron now, where now you have three times more dairy production in New Mexico than you have in Vermont. And, you know, and I, I don't think most Americans think of dairy production in New Mexico desert, but that's where we are. I mean, I, I drove out to it, I think two years ago. Um, if you go to Eastern New Mexico near the Texas borders where you see a lot of the dairy operations, you know, I mean, it's these massive things where first of all, look at the crop circle, look at these, um, you see the aquifers pulling out water that probably isn't sustainable. You have a bunch of cows in the desert. The reason why they do it down there is the manure dries up pretty quickly because it's hot. We all know it's undocumented men doing most of the work. And how can a Wisconsin dairy farmer doing pasture compete against us? You can't. Let's keep in mind. Um, and what we also see is just the incredible environmental de uh, deterioration of this model. I mean, Des Moines in a water crisis, a lot of rural America is in a water crisis where, you know, because a lot of this, you know, when Bill Gates owns farmland and he's not doing protections on it, you see a lot of, you know, people farming up to the creek, all the chemicals go in the water. I was flying into Iowa a few weeks ago and you're not supposed to put manure on your, you're not supposed to put that industrial manure on your fields in the winter, but there's fresh snow and you just fly in through Chicago and you see all the manure in the snow because Everyone, knows, you're not going to get fined for that. Um, also, going back to like what this means for you at the grocery store, I mean, there's that whole illusion of choice. I think peanut butter is a really good example of this. You know, um, back in the day when Standard Oil had its monopoly, it was just Standard Oil. But now, what the monopolist realizes, they need to hide behind different brands because that Whole Food shopper likes to think they're getting a different product than the Dollar General shopper. So they have these different brand price points. So you know, we have Smuckers has like a 50% market share. But most people don't realize it because they own these brands right here. And I should also say this is probably underestimated, this figure, because this is only based on brand, like a grocery store scanner data. And a lot of these companies also do the private label stuff. I mean, that's a big thing at this moment. And that's intentional is we have very bad data on market shares. I mean, that's why I love Pete Harding's paper that he's going to present is how in the heck did one company get an 85% market share in, in milk? in New York City and New England. I mean, that just tells you no one's paying attention. No one's measuring this because it's one thing we look at, you know, it can, you can look at national data for a search engine, but you're not going to, national data for hog slaughtering is kind of irrelevant. I'm not going to take a hog from Iowa and ship it to North Carolina. You know, I think a lot of in food, we really need to be looking at regional markets. Um, I also find this hard to keep up with because these markets are so concentrated. It's really easy to act like a cartel. There was this great story in Bloomberg from two years ago, right before Thanksgiving, being like every meat in America, including tuna and you know, salmon, is under investigation for price fixing. And then two weeks later, <laughs> they did a story of guess what? Turkey's under investigation for price fixing. I mean, that is where we are, is it's just constant price fixing. You know, it's almost a cost of business. At this point, companies get slapped on the wrist, don't do it, but the markets are so concentrated. So we should assume that they will continue to do this. I've expressed this personally. I think the Biden administration diagnosed the problem correctly here, but nothing they propose will do anything meaningful to address this. And also they keep saying regulations are coming on the PNS Act. We haven't seen them. These are dusting off old regs. Where are they? It's, we, we know what they're doing here is they're dragging their feet. So if Republicans take back the House, they can say, oh, look who killed it. Um, but this also means for labor is if we step back and think about you know food, the food system labor, not only the people that grow it, but pick it, process it, and transport it, port it, we see them being squeezed. And my whole point here is so there's all this great literature on you know how workers are being squeezed from the jungle to fast food nation, but there's no no job is inherently middle class. That is a construct. That is a result of policy choices. Take slaughtering. These are low wage workers that are exploited. We saw it. We got outraged, and we put in a bunch of protections that uplifted that to a middle-class job that people on both sides of my family did. And they were able to pay for, you know, have that middle-class living. And then what we see is a systematic assault by industry to then devalue that work and bring it back down to low wage. So we could move to a system where we actually elevate this, this work back to middle-class living. What we've also seen in, is like what it does to our community. I mean, this is stuff that no economists can measure, but it's the quality of life. I mean, there's this great paper by a young man in Iowa from Keokuk, it's down that little tip the little uh, southeast tip of Iowa, where, you know, 60, you know, back in the 60s, half the businesses were locally owned. And then the fast forward now, nothing's locally owned. And what that means is it's just when the 
executives live in the town. First of all, they're, they're the ones that finance a lot of the nonprofits, but there's also humanity. Like their kids on the same softball team, they're willing to show empathy to the workforce where now we live in an era where, you know, it's a bunch of consultants in some big city making these labor decisions to the fact that a candy factory closed right before Christmas and fired their employees. Like that's where we're at. I mean, this is, where's the dignity? Why not wait till February? You know, I think that's what a lot of people feel is just the lack of respect right now. And then what we see too, I mean, this is true anywhere in America is these slaughterhouse towns are basically modern day company towns. You know, these are they're super poor and super uh, uh, minority. Um, each town tends to have its own, you know, one town might be Guatemala, it might be Sudanese, but these towns, I mean, are true for chicken, beef. Um, this is what I did my college thesis on. But yeah, I mean, that you add in the fact that there's an undocumented, large pr proportion of this workforce is undocumented. You just, it's ripe for uh, labor, for uh, labor exploitations. Um, kind of my big point here is, I mean, we've seen the political, political polarization in America. And what I see this as is increasingly rural America has become an extraction colony. I know Secretary Vilsack was saying that the other day. I find that ironic considering he contributed to the extraction colony. He ran against industrial uh, hogs in Iowa as governor in 2002, and then he oversaw the largest expansion of industrial hogs in Iowa history right after he won. So it goes to show you how much his words matter here. Um, there's also this really good scholarship by the sociologist I love at Michigan named Robert Mundeka talking about um, the wealth concentration in America like being a regional thing. So what it used to be back in the 80s in America is life in Cedar Rapids, Iowa or Fond du Lac wasn't that different than Miami or Boston. You see it in like the distribution of income in America. What we essentially seen happen, fast forward to now, is superstar cities and left behind places. You know, you see these super dark black circles that what, what that means is their wealth incomes are way above the norm in America where there's much more regional balance than before. So it's basically, it's, I jokingly say it's the cities that are home to monopolists are doing well. Anyone that's been to Minneapolis knows a lot of that wealth is being driven by medical device companies. Same thing with Boston, DC has, it's, it's DC areas home to some of the richest counties in America. And a lot of that's just government graft or military defense contractors. So, I mean, part of that point there too, is just the, you know, the average American experience is diverging as these, as these communities diverge in their incomes and wealth. And what we've seen too is just a lot of in the rural Amer places in rural America. It's just you know you have crime, you have health, you have all these statistics just plummeting, and these essentially become some of the poorest parts of the country as you know the wealth leaves these communities. Um, this is a little controversial, but what I want to talk about too is I like to compare Farm Bureau and the checkoffs. Uh, I like to compare it to the book Animal Farm. <laughs> Where you know you have the pigs, oh, you know, it started with good intentions of everyone having power. And then what we see is basically all the power consolidated into one pig, Napoleon. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, the checkoff started, I mean, the first checkoff comes out of Florida in the Great Depression. How do we get Americans to drink more orange juice? Fine, great. We now have about 20 some checkoffs, you know, things from blueberries to Christmas trees. These are small organizations. Most of the checkoffs, and we're talking about checkoffs, are meat and dairy. And I know Sarah's done a lot of, been very public and brave on this subject. And I really do admire her for that. Because honestly, it was her quotes in the Milwaukee uh, paper that really brought it to my attention. We're talking, I mean, first of all, we don't even know how much money they have because USDA is that bad and that I would argue corrupt at reporting it. Um, we're talking, you know, I've seen an estimate between 600 million to a billion dollars a year. And the problem with this is, A, there's no transparency in how this money is spent. We've seen it quite a few examples over the years where it's actually spent against farmers to the benefits of corporations. And part of that reason is take the pork group, the pork truck off, the largest payer. So every unit you produce, you have to pay into this. Well, the largest producer of hogs in America is now a foreign corporation. So the most, the largest, you know, payer into the pork truck off is a Chinese corporation. So now you essentially have the voice of pig farmers acting in the interests of the corporation. That is oh, so many conflicts of interest. And then you add to the fact that the privatization that we've seen with our public university means a lot of the research dollars are coming from these entities. And so, you know, you hear these horror stories behind the scenes of academics being chased out or silenced or just not pursuing certain things because, you know, they don't want to upset the checkoffs. I mean, you can see behind me, I have a little frame back there. I actually framed a letter that a pork checkoff 
person in Iowa sent my dean at Yale saying I need a talking to. Because, you know, I tweeted out, they're building a multi-story CAFO in Iowa, and it was the first one to my knowledge, and I tweeted out, and they said I was being hysterical, and I needed a talking to. I framed that because I know if I was at Iowa State, I would have been fired. I'm fortunate enough where they don't have the power they do out here, but that's where we are. And that is why I compared them to Napoleon in the, in the animal farm is they got too high on the hog. They got too powerful. No one's checking their power and they're just comically corrupt. And Farm Bureau is the same way. I mean, I should also say when we talk about Farm Bureau, I'm really talking about Iowa. I mean, Wisconsin is a fraction of the size of Iowa. And that is because Iowa owns a for-profit multi-billion dollar life insurance company. So as the, you know, as farm, the amount of farms have collapsed in Iowa, you've seen this nonprofit take off surge. And that is because they have this insurance arm and the insurance arm only really cares about these corporations because that's where it has investments in. So what is quote, the voice of farmers is actually working against the interests of farmers and is working in the interest of corporations. So um, skipping that. So what kind of, what I wanna leave this conversation with is what we can do, what is next? Because it's easy to be dark and be like, oh, you know, I mean, this stuff is grim. But to me, this is a result. This is just an end of a Gilded Age era. This is how it usually happens. I mean, you have people, you have any, I mean, look at farmland values. Anyone, like, none of those values actually seem logical. And then the fact that the, you know, Super Bowl looks like it reminded, I think it reminds most people of those 1999, you know, dot com boom ads with all the crypto stuff just kind of tells you where we are. So, what to do? I'm a huge fan of phasing out KFOs. I mean, I know there was a huge study that came out on ethanol actually being bad for the climate yesterday. And my goal is that we can, as ethanol phases out, as we move to batteries for cars, we take that land and put it back in the pasture. And I think phasing out KFOs is one of the biggest things we can do in that way. Um, to help with that transition process, I really think we should push, and I know the Wisconsin Farmers Union has done a lot of work on this, is pushing the procurement power of schools to drive these supply chains. Because it's one thing when I put, you know, a local green pepper in a Dollar General, most people can't afford it, They're, you know, with their incomes being stagnant, but schools buy a lot. And dollar for dollar, school purchasing is pretty close to um, the farm bill. So imagine if we double the reimburse, we have, you, you get, you get what you pay for. <laughs> so we can serve our kids frozen square pizza that would be from the Amazon rainforest, or we can serve them meals from Wisconsin farmers. But, you know, we have to, in order to respect that life and get quality ingredients, we have to pay more. So I think increasing that reimbursement rate and using it to drive the supply chain of only pasture milk can be served in Wisconsin. That'd be huge. I mean, what a guarantee, you're, you're guaranteeing that income stream for a farmer, but then you're also keeping your money within the state. And I think politically it builds a unique coalition of who doesn't want all beef served in Wisconsin come from Wisconsin beef farmers. Um, we can also do is push your state AG to hire people for antitrust. Um, this survey was done before COVID and just because budgets have changed so much in the last few years. But at the time, Wisconsin had one state antitrust attorney. I would encourage them to hire more. I mean, Iowa two few years ago had zero, now we have two. And this is so important because you need cops in the beat. You need people out there going, what's going on with the fluid milk market? How do we bring a case? How do we you know, uncover what's going on here? I mean, the reason why you're seeing a lot of the antitrust cases coming out of New York State is because they have 14 attorneys looking at this stuff. Um, we can also do is when we talk about the next farm bill, I mean, I'm kind of a fan now at this point of almost junking the current system and moving to a stewardship payment model of saying, hey, if you do cover crops, you get X, like almost have a toolkit and let farmers, because the way you farm in, let's say, upstate New York is going to be different than the water issues you face in Oregon. But also, I would really push people to think of pilot programs. This is underreported, but the farm bill is full of pilot programs. And that's a really good way to test ideas, to get buy-in from people. Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa was really good at this, of doing little pilot programs of, hey, let's just spend $10 million in this farm bill in four states, let's try this. And what's great about it is, and he also would always put in these little lines of, you gotta do a study. What's great about that is when, we come, when it comes time for the next farm bill pilot, you know, discussion, you have a great study, the reference, and then you have a bunch of you know, politicians and people from that so state bought into the idea who can then push for a national version. So I'm a huge fan of that. Um, also, let's really rethink market structures. I mean, we're living in this libertarian hellscape where, you know, power, because when you deregulate, you move 
protections, power concentrates. And so thinking about how do we want our markets to look like? I mean, like what we've seen in beer is, you know, large brewers have that three tiered system and we've decided craft brewers, okay, you can pull, pull, you know, vertically integrate based on your size. And I would sit there and say, let's think about that for our food system. Like how should, how should these markets look like? So like going back to the meat, I'm a fan of saying like, you can only be in one line of protein. So if you slaughter chickens, you can't slaughter beef. You know, that would essentially break up Tyson's into four companies. Or, you know, I mean, putting merger caps on. I mean, that to me is, and President Biden appointed Leah Khan to be the Federal Trade Commission chair. She's my age and her appointment's huge. I mean, she comes out of this framework. She's the intellectual leader of this. And I actually met her five years ago when she wrote, she was a journalist before she went to law school and she wrote an article on chicken monopolies on how Vilsack and the Obama administration failed in 2010 to do anything meaningful. So that's huge. And pushing kind of this framework, I think is key. And just kind of like leave it on a happy note. And I know I say Iowa, but the same holds true for Wisconsin. The system we have now is radical. The, the vision we're talking about with grass, pasture, all that stuff, that is traditional. That is what we have. And I think that's such a key point because that's what industry will push back is, oh, we, you know, we can't go there. And it, it is radical that the largest owner of hogs in America is a foreign owned corporation. The largest owner of farmland in America is a tech you know, billionaire. Um, I also think, you think about what the system could be. Just imagine, like, Iowa, Wisconsin should be Italy. I mean, these should be the food hubs in America where people go for, you know, I mean, I love doing cheese tours in Wisconsin and all that kind of stuff, but really lean into that. Because, I mean, that's when, that's when rural areas thrive is when, they're, when these markets were deconcentrated and, and the money they generated stayed within their communities. Yeah, so on that note, that is my presentation. Sorry, I was a little bit over. Thank you so much, Austin. Great stuff. Um, I'm gonna try and moderate us here and uh, help with the Q&A and the discussion. Okay. So if you have questions, please feel free to use the hand raise thing on the reactions button down at the bottom and or type a question into the chat and we'll try and take them as they come. And I'll try to make sense of them as they come too. Uh, and I'll try and moderate a bit uh, if they come too fast. So anyway, uh, thank you so much, Austin. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we had some questions in the chat already. And uh, maybe I'll start with Jeff. I'm not even going to take a crack at that name. Sh I, I know I am. Shazinski. <laughs> Shazinski. Yeah, Shazinski. Shazinski. Go for it, Jeff. Just uh, very, very, thank you. Very, very good job. And uh, I, I have been following the Brandeis model <laughs> a little bit. And, uh, and some solutions are nice. Um, I just put in there one question about, I've been trying to track cooperative development or a new era of cooperative development, farm cooperative elements. O Farm is one that I've been working with. It's a organic farming and agricultural relation markets. And I think the Organic Valley that's probably the best market, the best uh, example of that. And with, um, you know, with the possibilities that that supply could be controlled by farmers, uh, it, it, there's, you know, there's a possibility that even legally, um, what do you think about that as another way to break some of the structural power? I think that's huge. I mean, I know a uh, Wisconsin scholar, Peter Carson, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, has done a lot of this. Um, a lot of it's just dusting it off. I mean, we've also seen though a lot, some of these co-ops have been, have gotten really kind of comically broken. Um, I don't know the nuance of co-ops as much, but that's the hope. I mean, that, my frustration here is more and more, and I understand this is edgy, is just my, is USDA. I've kind of increasingly view USDA as a Southern organization. I think it's kind of really fundamentally broken. Um, the fact, the problem with my co-ops is there's some really good ones, but then there's some bad ones. And it reminds me of food labels where people are doing it, like the inability to police them and make these things mean what they mean undermines people doing it right. So for the consumer, how am I supposed to know when I buy beef that says made in the US, it doesn't, it's from the Amazon rainforest. And the inability to solve that for decades now is kind of comically embarrassing. Um, and so that thing with co-ops is there's some co-ops we know doing it right, but then there's ones that taint it. 
So, I mean, part of this problem here is just getting USDA to do basic bureaucracy stuff. Yeah, also well, just to respond to that, the another thing I've been working with is blockchain and the, the potential disruptive technology of that in terms of public blockchains and transparency. So that very thing of the integrity of a label is possible with technology. I think I, it could be possible with technology. There's it's a more nuanced issue than I simply stated it there, but but there is at least growing possibility of true public transparency of supply chains. And that means in terms of the economics of them as well. So that when I buy a product, I will truly know how much the farmer received. Yeah, I mean, that's, this is out of my element at that point, but I will say, I mean, the fact that you're, you're carrying, I mean, that, that's what we need to happen here is people, it's like a muscle people haven't worked out for decades. And for the longest time, Peter, Peter was the expert on it. You know, like to my knowledge, Peter is the only living ag antitrust expert in America, well, legal scholar. And so just getting people to care is huge. I mean, if you can, the more you write about, it, the more you care, the more you talk about it, talk to journalists, that's huge because corporate, I mean, this, this system happened because people, I shouldn't say they weren't paying attention, but were they able to get away with it behind the scenes. And the more you find a flashlight onto it, the more we can hopefully get to a better system. Randy, looks like you're muted. There you go. Let me just follow on to that a little bit, Austin, if I can. And it, it, it's related to the thing I was grinding on as you were talking, and that is that, you know, there are there are winners, so to speak, in the current system, and it's few, right? It's the power and money concentrate towards the top. Um, and I think one of the major issues that we grapple with in Grassland 2.0 is that the folks who are not winning uh, and to a large degree, this is the farmers, this is the consumers, et cetera. So many of them are still willing to fight for the current system, even though they're not winning. Uh, I wonder how much you've thought about that. Um, you know, how do we address that? Uh, as, I mean, we've seen it with masks, we've seen it with, you know, health. Um, we, we might know intellectually what's good for society and what's good for people but people are resistant to uh, the notion that uh, transformative change be put upon them. That's, so two things on that. I think the biggest threat to our democracy is the antitrust consolidation of media. Because it doesn't matter what you say when people get their news from face, you know, from these super concentrated markets that create their own realities. I mean, in agriculture, to me, I don't think we'll get systemic change until we deal with the greed and the corruption and the rot at the checkoffs in the Farm Bureau. Because like in Iowa, the biggest paper, most important paper is the Iowa Farm Bureau spokesman. And they assert their own reality that's divorced from reality. I mean, they'll sit there and say on the cover page how much they love cover crops, but everyone will tell you the capital behind the scenes is the one stopping it. And so that's where I see a lot of this, you know, fake news, whatever you want to call it, coming from misinformation is this propaganda apparatus. I mean, we see it in agriculture news. I mean, with the collapse of like local media, I mean, Des Moines Register used to have a very robust ag news section that actually, I mean, a lot of my hog bearing stuff came out of research from them. But now we live in a day and age where a lot of the news sources in agriculture, is just propaganda arms of these because they live off checkoff money, you know? And so you're not having honest conversations about, it. I mean, the fact that people actually think manure digesters are going to do anything, it's just funny. <laughs> like, I mean, the research shows you that these incentivizes more manure. I mean, when you have industrial dairy operations making more money in California off manure than milk, that tells you something's wrong there. Okay, let's see. Lisa Dorr uh, had a comment in the chat. Lisa, I'm wondering if you want to uh, make that comment or ask a question out of it. Otherwise, I'd be happy to bring it to the fore related to export markets. I don't see Lisa jumping forward. So let me ask her a question for her. The question is related to uh, both Dem Democrats and Republicans sort of um, advocating for, or overseeing, let's say, maybe they're not advocating, but overseeing the expansion of CAFOs. And there seems to be, they seem to be enamored with export markets. Yeah. Is there an, an issue here that we can, uh, a lever here that we can pull on? Um. I mean, I think this is weird. I mean, this is me putting on a political hat. I just don't think you engage with that. Cause I mean, that's what they want to do is it's all about, 
I'd rather reframe it as, is it worth destroying our rural areas to feed other countries? In Iowa sense, I mean, the fact that most hogs are going to China, it's, is it worth destroying rural Iowa to feed China? And I don't think, I mean, people see it in the fact that the quality of life when most lakes are closed because the pollution is so bad in the summer, the home values are taking a hit, the water quality is getting, I mean, like your drinking water bills are getting higher. I, industry wants to talk about that. And I think also, I think we need to move away and shift to other ground. And I think part of it too is the quality of our food has just gone downhill. I mean, I noticed that in, I mean, this is so simple, but we got married in the fall and I purposely, we only serve Iowa food pasture. And the amount of Iowans in my family that told me they hadn't tasted pork so good, it just goes to show you we gotten so used to, you know, like a lobster boiling in a pot. Let's see, Ignacio Via, you wanna ask your question? Or make your yes, I, 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 I'm concerned that um, um, Austin mentioned the importance of um, school purchases as a major force in transforming the food system. Um, and I'm concerned that um, there's a lot of pressure um, to not use um, meat and whole dairy uh, because our nutrition science supposedly has uh, consistently um, said that we shouldn't be eating animal fats or anything like that. And it seems that that, that, that seems wrong given uh, um, the outcome of that kind of paradigm in nutrition. Just this wanted to is, yeah. uh, look at that. This is, give me a second, I'll come back in a second, but there's this really good new film called Coda about a fishing, working class fishing family in New England that I, re I recommend people watch. And part of it is, is they're dealing with consolidation as fishermen. And there's a scene where their daughter is eating the school cafeteria and they're eating, she's eating square beef pizza. And you're like, here are fishermen where their children aren't eating their product. Like, you know what I mean? If you're on the coast of New England, you should be eating fish, not Amazon beef. And the reason why I mentioned that is I think we need to embrace more regionalism in the way what we eat. Like it, you're going to eat food differently in Iowa than you are in South Texas or, you know, in Alaska. I don't think from a food standpoint, from a food system standpoint, especially at the federal kind of or state level, we should, I don't, that is not my place to get into. What all I care about is, is that the labor who makes it is paid a middle-class wage and from a client, I would prefer that the food being served is local, that reflects where they are. Um, what I think your comment is rooted in is just, there's also this thing going on, and this is something I don't wanna to touch, where you see a lot of Silicon Valley investors getting into sell meat, and that is because they want the IP monopoly of having, you know, own a thing. Kind of like what we saw with, you know, GMOs, like owning the seed. Um, so there's just a lot of money sloshing around, who knows? But to me, I think the focus should be on the labor component and sourcing locally and letting schools decide what to serve their student population because they'll know, trust me, every, every cafeteria worker knows what, you know, not only what their students like, but there is also a parental aspect to it. And this is kind of trivial, but I think about this a lot. My college, when you first walked into the dining hall, would always have fried food. And like, I loved it, but what an awful thing to do to stress out 19 year old is to have fried chicken right in front of me every time I saw that. And I think we need to accept a little bit more paternalism of being, you know, a professional, like which these food directors are, is making sure our kids are being fed a nutritional diet, how they see fit based on their education. Thanks, Austin. Uh, Laura Payne has a question that's in the same wheelhouse. Laura, are you willing to risk your bandwidth and ask the question directly? <laughs> Sure, I'll see how it holds up. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just, uh, I've been watching these farm to school programs for a long time. And, and we always come to a point where there's a, a big uh, financial gap between what the school district can afford to pay and what the direct market farmer needs to earn a living and wondering if you can talk about how we can uh, address that. Yeah, I mean, that's to me is a huge thing here. And that's why I think we should double the reimbursement rate. Because in the day, if you're gonna if you're gonna pay peanuts, you're gonna get peanuts for your kids. And I think it's actually a very 
I, I think it's such an easy political thing to win on. You know, who doesn't want to improve the nutritional quality of our kids' school food? Um, yeah. I think that, that to me is what I think. I mean, I'm also a wannabe politician. <laughs> <laughs> to keep that in mind, as I, thought, yes, but, I would vote for you, I think. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, I, I, I mean, just talking to, I mean, what really blew my mind is learning how little a lot of these CSA type farmers make. I mean, they're the only ones that really operate in the free market because they're basically doing labor for free because they earn so little. I mean, all these, they're not getting the, this Wall Street farm belt. They're not getting all these subsidies. And just from talking with them is just realizing how hard the farmer's market life is. You know, you can get rained out, you lose income, yada, yada. Um, you can't be real with people about the economics because they don't want to feel, you know, like that person from Madison, you know, people don't want to feel guilty <laughs> when they're buying your food, but just having these contracts where you're guaranteeing them income, I think would just be huge and help that. Like really, you know, let, uh, gives people that comfort of knowing, okay, you know, I'm going to make all these investments in my farming operation and I know I'm going to be selling X amount to this school district. And I think this to add another burden to our schools is unfair. And I think that's, to me, the hope here is that we can, you know, through the state or federal level, add additional reimbursement dollars. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I heard you say uh, who's against, uh, who, who's willing to argue against healthier meals, but I could already hear the <laughs> well, I mean, uh, folks <laughs> lining up to say, don't tell us what to do. I mean, that's, uh, well, that's the thing, though, is like, Randy, is, I mean, my, the hog burn I mentioned, writes the governor of Iowa $400,000 check for a re-election. I mean, trust me, I, I'm raising money now. If you tell a politician you can make phone calls for weeks on end asking for $100 or here's one big donor, they're gonna take the easy route. And that's how we got to where we are. You know, it's, you know, that's why you had Senator Klobuchar, what, a decade ago saying ketchup is a vegetable or pizza sauce, whatever. You get it, Cargill's based in Minnesota, they're powerful, but, a lot of people are operating under assumption of this farm bill coalition that was built in the sixties. And I just think America has changed and what people's expectation has changed. Yeah. Rosalie Cates uh, has a point to make about loving CSA farms, but the focus on vegetable farms kind of ignores a larger piece of the pie that is conventional production agriculture. And that so, sort of, just, yeah, go ahead, Austin. I was just mentioning that because it, it's you're catching me in February where the produce is garbage. <laughs> so that's like, that's top of mind to me, but you're right. But it's also, I'm not, I mean, we don't, you don't need to, sh I don't want to oversell it, but at the same time, you have this story yesterday that California is in what, a 1200 year record drought. We cannot have most of our produce coming from the Imperial Valley. <laughs> like that is a desert that really is taking water that shouldn't be, you know, I mean, the whole system is, like, it, we need to shift these supply chains. And the ideal system is you have a little here, a little there, a little, like, that's what we should be doing. And we used to have that. And so my emphasis now on that is more rooted in just a sense of urgency and why I don't think our government is responding to that urgency. Do you mind if I jump in, Randy? Please, Rosalind. It's just nice to see you. Uh, one of my concerns here, uh, the Ag School at Wisconsin put out the beautiful vision publication that they do every quarter last, last month, I think. And you had a big piece on the Ag School working on organic farming and they just show, you know, handfuls of carrots. And I have to say, you know, can we change the picture a little bit? It isn't just carrot raising and people out, you know, showing kids a seed growing into a green leaf. It just ignores production organic farming and there is such a challenge making a nickel in that business. I, I just want to get the focus back over there. Thank you. Th that to me goes back to labeling though and the USDA failure. The fact that you have a lot of people doing commodity organic production or just traditional, but then you have, does anyone really trust organics coming out of Turkey? <laughs> the extent of organic fraud, it's just comical. I mean, it also kind of defeats the purpose that when you get organic juice to Trader Joe's, it's coming from halfway around the world. Like we shouldn't be shipping liquid halfway around the world. Um, that's like part of my failure here is my critique of USA is just this constant comical failure of basic bureaucracy things they should be doing. I think we need to talk about it that way. It, it's just the, cause it's, it's like what we are seeing with dairy now, I mean, when I saw this with the hog burn article, you, you have these agencies say, oh, we'll study it, we'll study it. 
well, this isn't rocket science. We know what to do here. And studying this code for, we're going to outlast you. We're going to wait for you to go bankrupt. And the more days go by, the harder it is to revert the system. Okay, Jean Schrieffer, you've had your hand up for a while and it's nice to see your name and hear your voice, Jean. What would be the, I mean, part of the farm bill is an unholy alliance between the food SNAP programs for, for uh, poorer people uh, to gain support for the farm programs. If that were decoupled, uh, where programs had to stand on their own merit, would there be the support from Congress? uh for the farm bill subsidies for a very cynical per political perspective yes because of walmart walmart finances a lot of people in this space to talk about snap because most of walmart's workforce is on snap and that's where a lot of their clientele pays for the groceries so if you want to be really cynical i think you can decouple it and snap will be fine snap is a mandatory program so anyone who qualifies has to get it there's no way in heck walmart would let that go i mean that, that is like my cynical interpretation and I'm okay. I mean, that coalition was built in the 60s and that was before Americans suburbanized. I, I, this is also a political risk I'm, I, I feel comfortable making. It's just, you see the amount of like, take a look at Trump did. I mean, the amount of money they dumped into those markets, agricultural markets, he ran his mouth and then he essentially gave people a bunch of bribes. It was just incredible. Okay, we have a comment here from Allie Bergstrom, who says she does not have a microphone. Aside from CAFOs, there's still a major hurdle for pasture-raised hog producers who choose to raise their hogs without relying on subsidized corn and soy. What are some things that pastured hog producers can do to help dismantle the monopolization of feed sources? Oh boy. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know too much. I mean, I, I go back to procurement power, guaranteeing the contract, but um, the feed sources, I mean, that's the funny thing about these monopolizations is so much of this is, well, welfare is a loaded term to use. I don't want to use it, but like there's so much subsidies going into it where that is what I learned doing the hog barren piece is just how many rules, regulations were broken and ignored. And then how many subsidies go into that model? Like the fact that we have Conservation dollar, you know, like your program that comes out of the, the Dust Bowl conservation is now being used to finance hog CAFO lagoons via EQIP shows you how off the rails we've gotten when somehow manure lagoons qualifies as conservation dollars. I mean, that to me just adds to this, like, it's one of those things where you just, you go so far down the thing and at some point you're like, why are we doing this? Okay, two more, Austin, and then we'll let you off the hook. Okay. These are hard, so. No, they're fun, um, like, you're like political hotballs. <laughs> uh, Bonnie Keeler says, how do ag carbon markets feed into the existing system? Do they reinforce the status quo or are they actually offering a potential to transform to a new system? I, I tend to think it's, I personally think it's a bunch of snake oil, but it's also not the hill I want to die on. I mean, in <laughs> Iowa, I mean, I also say this, my dad is an ethanol truck driver. Like there's certain battles in life you have to pick. Um, in Iowa, they want to build three big ethanol pipelines to basically take the, few, you know, the, the gases from ethanol, move them up to North Dakota. They tell everyone it's because they're going to bury this gas on the ground. Like whatever, like it just sounds like you're not actually solving the problem here of like just polluting less. But then you're hearing all these rumors now, oh, they'll use it for fracking to help with, you know, you have to shove gas down. You just, you just hear this stuff and, when there's a certain people promising it, I don't know, fool me once, but you know, I don't know. I, I don't put a lot of stock to it. I just think this stuff is in the day, we just have to pollute less. We have to go to certain models that aren't as you know bad for the environment and thinking that there's a silver bullet here is just kind of a, you know, it's, I don't know if you, everyone here seen the movie on Netflix, uh, don't look up, but you know what I mean? That's the whole point too, is like, oh, here's that Silicon Valley guy that promises a silver bullet. And it turns out it doesn't work out, but he gets away with it and we all have to live with the consequences. Okay, Dr. Julie Dahl. Hi, Randy. Hi. I have a question for you, Austin. I very much appreciated all this great information. 
And I must admit, I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed (laughs) and depressed at the same time. You know, it seems like I can show you these or, you know, we can think about all these great examples of things happening across the landscape. Like, you know, things that Randy and Laura and others are working on and in here in Michigan. Yet it seems almost impossible to overcome kind of the challenges you're talking about. And I like that you included here are some things we can do. And yet, I mean, I'm in, you know, I feel very blessed in life. I, I'm not struggling right now financially and whatnot. And yet I have four young kids, <laughs> you know, I'm working like I, psychologists tell me I have a finite pool of worry and I feel like it's full already. Right. And so I guess my rambling question is something along the lines of, you know, I think it's things like Farm Bureau or these other organizations, it's what is the counter to that for us? Are you involved in any groups that could maybe speak for us in these ways? Or do you have suggestions if like here in Michigan, we kind of want to start developing more of a collective voice to do things in a different way. Do you see a good pathway for that? Yeah, no, I mean, I write down a bunch of notes as you talk. I mean, I say this on a personal note and not in my current job. Part of the reason why I'm running for office is that Hog Baron article really shaped me because what I realized was there was a rural rebellion in Iowa against these people lost. And so what I saw is these communities are in this collective Stockholm syndrome because their home values collapsed. You know, I mean, no one wants to sit there and admit like this power, this overarching power. And so you just see a lot of sad and angry people. And I can get angry and tweet on, you know, be on Twitter all day, or I can get a seat at the table. And I think my personal view is Democrats lack of vision on agriculture, a strong new one. And so I'm doing that. That is why I'm doing what I'm doing over there. But to your question, don't ever forget the power you have, like, and this is what I learned from doing antitrust stuff is you're never going to go dollar for dollar against them. But what you have is, I mean, you ha- truth is on your side. I mean, that sounds so corny to say, but like reach out to a journalist. I mean, I, I'm forever very, very proud of Sarah Lloyd on this call because she spoke truth to power and URLs, our news articles never die. I mean, you know what I mean? They're always on that website and you got to expose this. I mean, reach out to journalists. And if you sit there and see them, they, they say they frame a story wrong or what have you, just in the meanwhile, like, hey, you should really go talk to this or you kind of missed that. I do a lot of that behind the scenes. Hey, you should really talk to Sarah. You know what I mean? I, I, I tell everyone about Sarah. I mean, for that, because it's who do we decide to elevate and how we shape things really respond how the rest of us, because I mean, you know, most of us are busy raising kids, working nine to five. We don't have time. We trust that the system is helping us. And there are... I mean, to me, what gives me hope is there are people doing the right thing out there from, you know, Farmers Union to I'm on the board of SRAP, which we basically fight KFOs. Um, The key is how do we elevate them? And like that takes a collective effort to make sure, you know, where do we shine a flashlight on? How do we, I mean, there's a group in Iowa called the Practical Farmers of Iowa. You know, they're doing pasture, they're doing grass. How do we sit there and say, this is the future. This is what we want it to be. And like letting, I don't know. Sorry, I'm kind of rambling too, but that's kind of where I'm at is the corruption is around us. It's just, you know, it's handing that story to a journalist, spotlighting it and understanding. I really do think most Americans are good people. It's just people, we've gotten to this point because of systemic failure and not tolerating it is key. Sorry, that's like very emotional, like very, (laughs) but. I can deal with emotion. That's okay. (laughs) Thanks. I appreciate those thoughts. No problem. I mean, the secret for my marriage is I'm very emotional. My husband's very like that. And so like, it's a good counterbalance. (laughs) This is hard. Like you sit there and see this stuff. I was livid when I saw the bill sack. The fact that his son, as secretary of agriculture, his son left one of the highest paying corporate firms in Iowa to go work for an ethanol baron trying to build one of these pipelines. And the pipeline is only economically feasible if his father delivers that piss That really bothers me (laughs) because it's like, what is enough for you? When is enough money enough? When most people I know are barely, my class valedictorian works at a used bookstore in town is is not clearing 25,000 a year as an assistant manager working full time. And to see that greed, 
first of all, someone someone told that reporter that that's how that story came about highlight, but then also saying that is not appropriate. And everything I said critiquing USDA, I understand will get me in hot water. My grocery store got me a USDA grant. I've been in hot water already. And speaking this, saying this behavior is not acceptable, puts you in hot water with powerful people. But whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like life goes on. You kind of got one life to live. And sometimes you got to live with yourself. And, you know, my name is all I have. And so I think just speaking that truth is the power you have. Because shame goes a long way with these people. Gene, uh, do you, speaking of power, do you uh, have some comments that you'd like to make with respect to the USDA? Or are you satisfied with them in the chat? Are you there, Gene? Oh boy. Gene's uh, asking in the chat whether USDA is meeting its mission mandate and uh, lists the mandates uh, that USDA has in their mission, which is to provide economic opportunity through innovation and helping rural America thrive and promoting ag production that better nourishes Americans while helping feed others through the world and preserving the nation's natural resources through conservation. Thanks for that, Gene. Well, I, in the absence of any other questions or comments, this has just been fantastic, Austin. I have one last question for you. Oh, I see Peter yeah. Donovan raised his hand here real quick. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Austin. This has been great. Um, I appreciate your mention of Stockholm Syndrome, which Laura Jackson first raised in a, in a 2005 essay. Hmm. And it relates to the relationship between the flow of power to monopoly corporations and the hollowing out of most of our rural communities, the decline in population, the decline of, of newspapers, the general outsourcing of local government power, conservation district power, the NRCS to the state, to the feds. You see any parallel between um, working against large corporate power and the need to foster stronger, more responsibility taking rural communities. I mean, yeah. what I see is, is rural communities have abdicated their responsibility in so many ways. I wouldn't use that word. Uh -huh. I would, um... You have to keep in mind, too, that the home values in these rural areas have collapsed. And as we've seen, like with Madison, I mean, let's be frank, Epic is driving a housing boom in Madison. And Epic is quasi-monopoly when it has a 70% market share in EMRs. That has this, and the Fed is engaging in, you know, cheap money era. And so you're playing the assets of the rich. And so the successful parts of America, the home values are going to appear in the people in these areas where the housing values collapse, just can't afford to move to these markets. Um, there is no really middle in America. And like, if you don't, you know, I mean, with the privatization of higher ed, um, I don't know. I just think that ladder of opportunities rotted away and I don't want to put it on people. I think this is more structural. And a lot of people like going back to that Vilsack example were hoodwinked. I mean, when someone promises rent, it wasn't like the, um, his, uh, Phil Sack's opponent was a lobbyist for the hog baron. He wasn't hiding what he is. But when someone promises to be your friend and then knifes you in the back, that's when people give up. Is they were promised the moon and they were delivered something else. And so, you know, I mean, going back to that map politically in Iowa, you see, you know, it's a 50-50 split politically what happened. Look at the driftless region. And then you just seen like, um, we've seen what happens. I mean, when the secretary of agriculture goes from that to working at a dairy chuck off, making a million a year. And like, once you see those industrial dairy farms in Mexico, you're just like, oh, this is all, this so much had to go wrong for this to be the norm in America. And then back to secretary. I mean, part of that is, I'm really bothered because I think we missed a moment. It's, um, but let's keep in mind the president comes out of a tax haven full of chicken CAFOs. So like, did we expect different? It wasn't like Biden was taking on big chicken. So, I mean, that's up to us to sit there and say, demand more. I mean, there was a lot of, I mean, there was a lot of people speaking, pushing Marsha Fudge for secretary. Um, so I, I know I'm dancing, I'm like 
kind of meandering, but to your question, I just don't put it on people. But that's also like, I'm saying this as a first generation college student with most of my family voting for Trump and saying that with like a little bit of empathy of understanding why people are behaving the way they do because of the collapse of the structures around them. When most of America, you know, the downtown's dead, the mall's dead, and the only downtown left is Walmart. I think that's where you get to where you are. I just think there's an epidemic of loneliness. And I think food is the cure here of having these public spaces, markets, what have you, being that. I mean, that's, I think that's what people are craving is that human touch and that sense of decency. But I have to also say this because I, I need to have help right now. <laughs> Okay, uh, Austin, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have the privilege of the last question, and it's related to what I stated at the beginning, which is that our Grassland 2.0 project is keen to develop this transformation plan, which we hope provides hope and uh, uh, more than just hope, but uh, some ideas about how to move forward in a systematic way. And of course, the elephant in the room is related to your title, which is Wall Street's Farm Bill. Can you shed any light on how the farm bill is actually developed and how people here might get involved in helping to shape it so that it is more beneficent for more people. Yeah, I mean, two big things is, first of all, you have some great, you do have great members of Congress in Wisconsin pushing good progressive stuff. Um, I think from a small thing, really push pilots. I think pilots are huge. We're not gonna change this. Everything I said, I privately view as a 20, 30 year discourse change, you know? These things just have to run themselves into a ground. Um, I think putting pushing pilots allows you to slowly put concrete examples, like points on the board, things you can point to as these systems slowly change. Because you're not, we're not gonna scrap it overnight. We didn't get here overnight. You know, the whole farm bill, that freedom of the farm with the 1996 farm bill was first proposed in the 1960s. So I think for people here is think about what would be a cool pilot? You know, reach out to Pokan's office, reach out to Baldwin's office, but you have to come with the idea of bait. I mean, these offices are moving a mile a minute. They're young, they're underpaid. So do the thinking for them, work with them, but just thinking what's something that we can build upon? Like you got to put points on the board and then you also got to advertise that you put points on the board, you know, being strategic of, okay, what states are these pilots going to happen in? Making sure there's an evaluation process, you know? Um, one little example is Senator Harkin, started a thing called the fresh fruit program where every low-income kid in America is guaranteed a piece of, of a fresh fruit or vegetable at school. And that started as a pilot program. And he did that in a very strategic way. And so I would take that. And so if our goal is to get over here in this grassland thing, is figuring out how do we put examples that are going to be very politically powerful, you know, and where at. So that's kind of what I encourage people here is to do that deep thinking, do the deep thinking, but also you have to reach and connect with the congressional office and you know, basically give them the idea, help them because if they're not gonna find it, you know, they're not gonna, these staffers aren't gonna read a 40 page paper. You have to like really work with them on it and build those relationships. The staffers aren't reading the scientific literature. <laughs> Heck, I mean, someone just sent me a 200 page dissertation yesterday and I was like, oh God, I can't, you know, especially like after, you know, we're all working virtually, there's only so much screen time. I think a lot of us can handle. <laughs> well, uh, that's a good note. Yeah, but... I know on that note. <laughs> So thank you so much, Austin. I, uh, please join me in thanking him uh, virtually, however you might, we might do that with clapping. And otherwise, I really appreciate your time and energy and expertise here. Uh, very provocative, lots of us for us to grind on. And uh, we'll look forward to our next uh, conversation. So thank you. I mean, this is so such an honor as a Wisconsin grad to come back here. Well, virtually come back here. We'll get you back up here soon. Oh, I will. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.